época a researcher at the Spanish Public Institution CIMAT, and I work at the Plataforma Solar de Almería, and I have been invited to give this training lecture on behalf of, of the European project India H2O. And the title of this training is Understanding Automatic Control and its Application to Water Treatment. And I think it can be appropriate for students related to water treatment, but without knowledge of, about automatic control. Um, firstly, I would like to say that control systems are described by differential equations and automatics and mathematics is an important tool and maybe because of this uh, control design can be a difficult to understand but in this case we are the objective is just to give just general ideas and the application for water treatment so I have avoided equations in this course so let's go to start uh, in this short course, we are going to understand a basic knowledge about automatic control. We will understand the idea behind some control structures. And we will analyze application of these controllers for the case of water treatment systems. And I have divided this course in two main blocks. Firstly, we will see an introduction of automatic control. And then we will see some control structures divided in three main uh, issues. Key concepts, uh, block diagrams, and the water treatment application. So let's go to a start. Um, if you can see definitions of automatic control, you can read, for example, that automatic control is a device or, or a process working by itself with little or not direct human control. You can also see that automatic control is to get that the variables in a process are maintained with a, within the finite limits and with a decided behavior, minimizing the effect of external variables. But probably if you are not involved in this science, this kind of definition can be a little difficult to understand. So the best way of to understand which is automatic control is to use an example of that I hope you, you understand perfectly, which is to take a shower. This is an example that you can find in the first courses of control. And it is easy to understand which is automatic control. And when you take a shower, I guess that uh, the first thing that you do is to open the water tap then you touch the water with your hand and then you start to manipulate the tap trying to reach the desired water temperature. Okay, this is not exactly automatic control because you do it manually, but it can give you an idea of, uh, of the, the things that automatic control do. Uh, so finally, automatic control uh, is to observe the behavior of the real process. Uh, compare the behavior with the desired one, and then act over the process to reach the desired objective. So let's go to let's go to see some definitions that it is important to understand in order to to understand the slides as we are going to be to see later. Um, and we will see these definitions with the with the example of taking a shower. First of all a plant or a process is the device the, that you want to control. In the case of the sour, in, is the, the plant is the sour and you. Uh, the output, which is also called the controlled variable or the process variable, is that variable that you want to control. In the case of the sour, is, the output is the temperature of the water. The input, which is also called the control variable, is that signal that uh, if you change uh, the plant output changes. For example, in this case, the input is the tap, because if you modify this input, your water temperature is going to change. 
the reference or set point is the value that you want in the in the output. Uh, for example, when you are taking a shower, you are you feel very comfortable when you, when the temperature of the water is 37 Celsius degree. For example, this is your set point. The error is the difference between this value, the set point, and the real value of the temperature in the water. A disturbance is something external to our system that affects to the to to your to the process. For example, you are taking the shower. You it's the, maybe it's the best moment in the day. You are singing. You are so happy. Um, suddenly, someone in the kitchen starts washing the dishes, and maybe for that reason, the flow in the pipe changes, and maybe the water temperature changes, and you don't feel happy anymore. That's a disturbance. An actuator is a device that is applied to the that applies the input signal to the plant. In this case, we have some kind of bulbs here to modify that that uh, which are the actuator. Um, the constraints are limitations in the variables. For example, in this case, we have a maximum and a minimum value of the tap aperture. Let's go to see some other definitions important. We, can, we have to see the difference between open loop control and closed loop control. Uh, in open loop control, information is not gained directly from the measurement of the control signal, which means we have our set point. Remember the, the value that we want to achieve, our controller that give, that give us a control signal. Uh, our plant and then our controlled variable. Uh, for example, uh, we can see this kind of dosifier pumps that you use in pretreatment in water treatment plants, and uh, that you choose the quantity of, of, of doses that you want to apply in the pretreatment uh, by changing these buttons, but you don't you don't measure the con that the flow is correct. You you trust in the in these dosifier pumps. This is an open loop control. Um, but closed loop control, feedback control, uh, the thing is automatic control is based on the key idea of feedback control. In feedback control, the control signal is measured. Uh, I mean, we have again this our set point and our control variable we can measure this control variable and we use this control bar, um, value to evaluate the error and this error is going to be used for the controller in order to calculate the control signal. Feedback is fundamental because we can deal with disturbances in or model errors, but also uh, feedback has limitation or weakness uh, because it can produce oscillatory responses, and so we have to design very well the controller in order to avoid these oscillatory responses. An example of feedback control, again with the pretreatment, is for example uh, in this case uh, in, in, the, in reverse osmosis unit, you have to uh, pretreat the water that you are going to use uh, in the feed water because uh, uh, the membranes must be must be clean. So you can um, use a feedback controller uh, and a valve. So the valve, uh, with the valve, you can regulate the quantity, the flow of pretreatment chemical additives in order to achieve the pH that you want in the feed water tank. You measure the pH, you choose the set point that you want in the pH, and your controller acts over this valve to increase or reduce the quantity of chemical additives. So now we know we have seen some definitions. Let's go on with the different control structures. Some authors has, uh, have the, um, classified the control structures uh, depending on the, in the industrial application or they, they use in the industry. Um, 
In the first category, we can see basic control approaches, for example, on-off, PID, cascade, or feed forward. In the second one, which is advanced control, there are different uh, control techniques. We are going to see uh, the multivariable controller. And in the third category, which is our advanced control, but uh, techniques that have been widely used in the industry, we are going to see the model predictive control. So let's start with the on-off controller. The on-off controller is the simplest controller. And the output of this controller is the maximum or the minimum value, depending on the signal of the error. It is useful to keep the process variable close to the set point, but uh, the result can be, you can observe some oscillations in the result. This is the scheme of the, of the on-off controller. You have, again, your set point. You have your controlled variable, uh, the measurement of your controlled variable, and you can calculate the error with the difference between the set point and the control variable. And depending on the signal of this error, your control signal is going to be the maximum or a minimum value uh, that is going to ab apply to the plant. But if you want to avoid continuous changes between uh, the maximum and the minimum, you can include uh, hysteresis uh, in the control, in an on-off control signal. Let's go to see an example. An easy example of on-off controller is the level in a tank. Uh, in this case, you have a tank and you have a pump and the pump can be activated or deactivated. And for example, here you want to maintain the tank level in 300, 320 millimeters. And at the beginning, you have a level of 330, more or less. And this level is decreasing, decreasing. And when the level reaches 320 millimeters, the pump is activated. It goes to the maximum value. So since the pump is activated, the level starts to increase and when the uh, reaches the set point, which is the green gray line, and uh, when the, the level in the tank achieves more or less uh, 310, the pump is turned off. So the, we go to the minimum value. And you can see some kind of oscillations around your set point. Um, let's go on to the PID controller, the second controller that we are going to see. Uh, the PID controller, you know, is the most common algorithm. It has the ability of eliminating a steady state offset, which means that the error at the end is going to be close to zero if you use an integral axiom. And we can say also that it can anticipate the future because the derivative actions gives you an idea of the tendency of the error. And for this, uh, knowing this tendency, you can, you, you, we can say that we can anticipate the future. Uh, this is the scheme of a PID controller. Again, we have our set point, our control variable. Um, with this measurement, we can evaluate the difference between the set point and the control variable to calculate the error. And now we have three blocks. The proportional gain, the proportional action, in which the error of the signal is multiplied by a parameter which is called the proportional gain. Again, here we have uh, the, uh, the integral action. Uh, so we have to calculate the integral of the error and multiply this value by the proportional gain and the integral time, another parameter. And the derivative action, uh, uh, here we have to calculate the derivative of the error and multiply this value by the proportional gain and uh, another parameter which is called the derivative time. These three blocks can be calculated uh, in parallel in this case, which we, we have a PID with non-interactive form, which means that the, these three blocks are calculated in parallel. 
and uh, we can calculate these three values to sum up to sum these values and evaluate the control signal. You can find different ways of combining the actions uh, and to uh, this is the the non interactive form, but again you can find different ways to to combine these these actions um, one important thing is that actuators has limitation. Remember, for example, that a valve can be fully open or fully closed, or uh, uh, a pump has limited speed. Um, so your control signal uh, is going to be saturated because the actuator has to uh, has uh, limitation. And it may happen that the control variable reaches the, the maximum value, um, the actuator limits. And in this case, we say that the system runs as open loop because your control signal, uh, uh, the actuator remains at its max, uh, at its limit despite the, despite of the controller output. And if we have an integrating an integral action, the error will be continually uh, increasing. Um, this integral term may become very, very large. It is then required that the error has opposite signed to, to achieve that the, the things go to, to normal. Uh, at the end, the consequence is that if your actuator is saturated and your integral, you have an integral action, uh, it could produce large transients when the actuator saturates. And there are, there are several ways to, to avoid integral wind up because this phenomenon is called integral wind up. And one way is the back calculation uh, methodology, methodology, the anti-wind up with back calculation, um, in which your con you, have, you can calculate the difference between the control signal saturated and the output of your controller to calculate the difference. And this difference is going to be used in the integral action in order to more or less uh, reset the integral part dynamically. Let's go to see an example uh, which of a PID controller is the hydrogen peroxide in a solar photophenton plant. Um, the solar photophenton process is used in water treatment for eliminated of po po pollutants. And in this process, hydrogen peroxide is uh, consumed. And it is, but, in, uh, but also is one of the most important operational parameters because it affects the reaction rate and the process efficiency. But at the same time, it is expensive. So if it, if we perform a manual dosing, we can obtain a low process performance. So we can um, we can calculate or design a control system in order to reduce the hydrogen peroxide in this case. Uh, so in this case, we have a, a photophenton process process with compound parabolic concentrators. Um, the measurement, uh, we have the measurement of uh, the dissolved oxygen concentration because this uh, value is related to the consumption of hydrogen peroxide. So in this case, the authors uh, design and test a PID controller with anti-wind up in order to um, maintain the dissolved oxygens by increasing or reducing the hydrogen peroxide pump. Uh, so for example, here we can see that the set point in this case was 150%. Um, and you can see that uh, the red line is the flow of the hydrogen peroxide, uh, the, the doses of hydrogen peroxide. And you can see how this hydrogen peroxide uh, flow rate changes in order to achieve the desired dissolved oxygen uh, concentration. 
Let's go move to another controller, which is the cascade controller. Cascade controller uh, can be used when there are several measurement signals and one control variable. Uh, the control problem is divided in, for example, two time scales and two control loops, an inner control loop, which is also called the slave, and the outer control loop, which is also called the master. Let's go to see the scheme of this controller. Uh, we have again the same control structure, our set point, our control variable that we are measuring, and then the error is calculated. Um, the primary controller calculates our control signal in base of our of the error. But this control signal is at the same time the set point for the secondary controller that again uh, calculates the control signal that is applied to the plant and this measurement goes to to calculate the error. Let's go to see an example. Um, cascade controller are very useful in, in reverse osmosis unit. For example, in, when you want to control the per made flow rate in reverse osmosis unit, uh, here you have the flow transmitter, uh, measurement of the flow. To control this flow, you can uh, act over the pressure at the inlet. And this pressure at the inlet is uh, at, the same at the same time the set point of a, of a controller that acts over this valve uh, that changes the pressure. This valve changes the pressure and this pressure produces a, a change in the flow of the permeate. So this is a cascade controller. Uh, let's go to see a uh, fit the fifth forward. Uh, fit forward. Uh, it is very useful because it can it eliminates the effect of disturbances. Remember, disturbance is this peop, this uh, person who opens the the start to wash the dishes when you are taking your shower. This kind of disturbance. Uh, so fit forward eliminates the effect of disturbances before they have created control errors. Uh, but we need a model of the process and we need also to measure disturbances. And it is uh, usually complemented with feedback control. This is an example of fit for and uh, the scheme of uh, fit forward control combined with a feedback control. Uh, again, we have the same structure than before, our set point, our controller. We measure the control variable, the feedback to calculate the error between the set point and the controlled variable. And the output of the controller, this control signal at the output of the controller, is combined with the output of our, of our feed forward. In this case, the fit forward uh, includes a model of the system. So if we can measure the disturbances that affect to our plan and we know the set point, we can calculate with, with this model um, the value that we have to apply in our actuator to achieve our, the desired control variable. But since the, fit, the models used to have some kind of errors, it is uh, combined with a feedback control. An example of this of fit forward, we are going to see um, the case of a three-way valve in solar membrane distillation. Uh, membrane distillation, uh, here we can see the membrane distillation module. Um, to produce the distillate in this membrane distillation, we had to apply a, dif a pressure difference between the both sides of the membrane. And this, and this, two, this pressure difference is uh, obtained by uh, applying a temperature difference. So at the end, we need to um, a temperature at the inlet of the membrane distillation um, around six, between 60 and 80 Celsius degrees. Um, so the membrane distillation is combined with a heat exchanger and then we can obtain this te the temperature that we want at the inlet of the heat, this heat exchanger uh, coming for example from a heat generation system like for example our solar field. 
And if we want to maintain uh, the temperature at the inlet of the heat exchanger at a desired value at our set point, we can use this three-way valve in which the water coming from the heat generation system is uh, combined with the water coming with, uh, from the heat exchanger, from the cold side of the heat exchanger, from, from this side of the heat exchanger, which is uh, some temperatures low, uh, the water here is some temperatures lower than the, at the inlet. So modifying this valve, we can achieve the temperature that we want at the inlet of the heat exchanger. Uh, this, uh, we can apply a, con a PID controller, for example, to achieve the temperature that we want here. But if we have measurement of our disturbance, which are the temperature that come from the heat generation system, and we have also this disturbance, which is the temperature of uh, the outlet of the heat exchanger, and we can easily model the process here because with mass and heat balance, we can uh, estimate which is the aperture that we want, we need here in the valve to achieve the um, uh, set point that we want at the inlet of this heat exchanger. In this case, uh, uh, a PI controller with anti-wind up and feed, uh, feed forward action has been applied. And you can see how the red line, which is the temperature at the inlet of the heat exchanger, uh, reaches uh, the set point, which is the black and dashed line, uh, despite uh, the changes in the, these two disturbances, which are the temperature uh, uh, coming from the heat generation system, this line, and the temperature coming from, uh, from the heat exchanger, which is this one. Uh, here we can see how the aperture of the valve changes in order to maintain the temperature that we want. Let's go to, to another uh, controller, which is a multivariable controller. Multivariable controller, it allows us to deal with more than one controlled variable. We can control simultaneously uh, different variables, for example, M, with a different number of available control signals. And we have to, it is normal to use the coppers to compensate uh, the interactions between, variable, the, between the different variables. We are going to see an example with the scheme. So again, we have the same structure, our set point, our control variable, we measure the control variable to calculate the error, and we have our controller that calculates the control signal. But in this case, the thing is that if we change the control variable, it, this control variable is not going to affect only to the controlled variable one, but also affect to other variables in the system. And the same happened in this case with the control variable two that not only affect to this variable, but also to another or to other controlled variable. And we have to design some kind of the coppers to reduce the interaction between these two, uh, these variables. Let's go to see an example. You can see uh, examples of multivariable controllers uh, for the case of, of reverse osmosis unit also. But in this case, we are going to see a nanofiltration pilot plant. And uh, it is something similar, more or less. Um, here, uh, the authors in this case want to control the permeate flow rate. In this case, we have our flow transmitter. We want to maintain the flow here in the permeate, but also um, to control the pressure at the inlet of the nanofiltration membrane. And we have as control signals the speed of this pump, of the pressure pump, and the aperture of the recirculation valve. And the thing is, if you change the speed of the pressure pump, it's going to affect to the pressure at the inlet of the nanofiltration membrane, but also it's going to affect to the flow of the permeate. And the same happened with the aperture of this valve. If you change this, this aperture, uh, not only is going to affect to the pressure, but also to the flow. So you have to 
to design a multivariable controller in order to calculate which is the combination of aperture and, and speed and avoid interaction between the two uh, controlled variables uh, that you want to maintain. And let's go move to the model predictive control. Of course, you can find different strategy, different control strategies, but we are going to see just some of that have been applied in uh, in water treatment. Uh, model predictive control is not a specific control strategy, but includes uh, um, uh, characteristics of different control methodologies. The ideas are. Uh, we need to use, we need a model to predict the output in a future time, which is our horizon. Uh, the control sequences is calculated by minimizing an objective, objective function that you define. And uh, it is a receding strategy. I mean, in at, it, at each sample time, you move uh, for, to the future. You, your horizon is moved to the future. Uh, in order to understand model predictive control, uh, Professor Eduardo Fernandez Camacho from the University of Seville used um, an example that I can, I think it can be very, very intuitive to understand which is model predictive control, and I'm going to, to use it. Um, model predictive control is like, uh, it's similar to drive a car because you, you see, you can predict your future movements uh, because you know you are you are seeing the future, you are seeing the road, and you have in your mod, uh, the model in your brain, and you can predict what you are going to to your movements in, in the road by driving the car. And the difference uh, with classical control strategies, uh, for example, PID controllers, is uh, you don't. It's like you were driving the car by only using the mirror. You only uh, with the past value, so just using the mirror. And this is the scheme of the model predictive control. Uh, you have a model where you need to feed this model with past input and past outputs and with future inputs that are obtained from, from the optimization. This optimization, you need to define a cost function and also you can include constraints in the optimization. Um, again, we have here your set points, your reference, and now you calculate the errors, the future errors, between uh, the difference between the reference trajectory and the outputs that you predict, predict with your model. Let's go to see an example in water treatment. Again, you can see different uh, examples in reverse osmosis unit. In this case, we are going to see uh, this is very typical in reverse osmosis unit. Uh, uh, you see, for example, uh, in this case, you want to control the flow, the permeate flow rate at the outlet of the reverse osmosis unit, but also you want to control the conductivity. And you have two input. Uh, your control signals are, remember this valve, the aperture of this valve to increase the flow of additives that it's going to change the pH at the inlet of the feed water and it's going to affect the conductivity. And also you can act over the high pressure pump to the velocity of the, the speed of this pressure in order to change this pressure, uh, the pressure at the inlet, which is going to affect to the flow and the conductivity also in the permeate. So with a model predictive control, you can control these two values, the permeate and the conductivity, by calculating the aperture of the, PA, the this valve and the speed of the pressure pump. Uh, in this case, the um, function that you the, the authors minimize is the difference between the set point in these two values and the con and the measurement of the of the variables. But also, it's also something very typical in, uh, in model predictive control is to include in the um, in the objective function to minimize the control action, which means minimize the apertures of this valve and minimize the changes in the high pressure pump. 
But I would like also to show you another example of model predictive control because in, pre in the previous case, we can use model predictive control to, to calculate the, uh, the control actions in the aperture of the valve or the velocity of, this, of, of a pump to achieve our set point. But also we can use a model predictive control to calculate the optimal set, set points that we have to, uh, to maintain in one system. Uh, in this case, we have again our membrane distillation module. Um, remember, we have our membrane distillation module, the, what is, which is coupled to a heat exchanger, and we need a temperature between 60 and 80 Celsius degrees here at the inlet of this heat exchanger. And this temperature is obtained by using a solar field here. And the thing is, uh, uh, we can use model pred predictive control to, with the objective of maximize the distillate production of this module and minimize at the same time the specific thermal consumption. And the results of this um, of this um, um, model predictive control, the output of uh, our control signal is in this case is the set point here at the outlet of the solar field and the set point in this flow, uh, in this flow, in this line, the flow rate in this system, in this pipe. And so model predictive control can give us our set point, the best set point that we have to maintain. And this set point can be uh, controlled, can be of, uh, reached by applying different classical controllers. For example, in this case, we can apply a PID controller with feed, feed forward to regulate, uh, to change, to regulate this, this mm, the velocity of this pump and achieve the desired water temperature at the outlet. Um, and in this case, this uh, flow can be maintained again by using this pump uh, as control uh, uh, with another PI, with a PID controller with anti wind for example. So, and that's all. Again, I have to say thank you to European Project India H to O to to invite me here, um, and I hope yeah, to uh, uh, you enjoy with this presentation. Thank.